Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of the Attack Angle. Uh, I'm Tom Dimitrov. Um, I'm here with, again, Coach Jay Lasley, Matthew Kelly, Eric Bounds, and we got an awesome coach tonight, the strength and conditioning coach at Walton High School, uh, Chris Romano. How are you, Coach? I'm good. How are you guys? Doing great. Um, I'm going to run through this. Uh, it might take me a, a split second to kind of read all the uh, things that you've accomplished, but I, I'm going to do it because we, we need to brag on you because uh, you put in the time and effort and it needs to be said. So, Coach, you are uh, at Walton High School. You're the coach, uh, the strength and conditioning coach and a sports scientist at Walton High School. You're the assistant baseball coach. Uh, you got a master's degree in ex exercise science. You're national strength and conditioning and you are a level two FMS uh, and a certified sports nutritionist. Um, you're also part of one of the 37 high schools worldwide to be named a National Strength and, Court and Conditioning Association Strength of Award winner in 2020. You've been nominated as the 2020 NSCA High School Strength Coach of the Year. Uh, you've also spent time with the Braves and the Dodgers. You've also worked with Kennesaw's football team as a strength, strength and conditioning coach. And you are one of the National Strength and Conditioning uh, Association, Association's Google Cameo coaches, creating video and demonstrations. Uh, and you've also, you help with all sports programs, baseball, football, fast pitch, cheerleading, boys and girls basketball at Walton and lacrosse. Um, and you also have a background of playing baseball, football, alpine skiing, Olympic weightlifting. You've also represented Team USA five times as a master lifter of the Olympic weightlifting comp and competing in two world championships and three Pan Ams. All right, I'm going to take a deep breath now because I just got all through it. <laughs> I was impressed that you got it all out. I was trying to get yeah. through it. And, uh, wow, that's impressive, Coach. Uh, so uh, how long did it take you to get all this? And can you just kind of walk us through kind of your background, um, what you do really at Walton, and, and how that's taken, taken shape? Sure. Um, I guess I got, I started out with the USA, USA weightlifting um, certification in 20, was it 2013 or 2014 is how I started um, on the private side. And I, mean, I was, I was into competitive weightlifting um, and really it dates back to originally at Walton when I was a student there, um, I really enjoyed our weight training class. I had a, a coach that was passionate, um, Jim Sedlacek, and he got me interested in it and I went to college. I was hoping to play baseball um, in the minor leagues and got injured um, in overuse injury and went and fell back on my economics degree. I got a, I've got a BS in economics as well. Um, worked on, on the wall street thing for a few years was absolutely miserable. Um, can't stand sitting in a cubicle. <laughs> and, um, you know, I would take, I would take, longer lunch breaks than I was supposed to and, and hit the gym. And, um, my wife's job brought it, brought us back to Atlanta. And, um, fortunately she has a really good job and I was able to leave the finance, you know, the financial sector and, um, you know, get back into, into, into training. And, um, that piqued my interest in coaching. So I guess what, seven, seven and a half years. So, you started off, um, you, you owned your own little gym and then not own little gym, but you owned your gym and then you started connecting yourself to Walton High School. Can you kind of just talk about that process of transitioning from owning your own business and how that played effect into working back into helping over at Walton High School? Sure. Um, I mean, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, you know, I, I was I was working at a private gym and realized, OK, you know, I'm, I'm helping this guy build his business. and I'm not really getting anything out of it. Um, so I opened my own gym and doing that, yeah, it, it was less hours coaching and more hours managing and marketing and, um, you know, running the financials and, and stuff like that, which clearly wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And I missed the team aspect and I, through weightlifting, um, I was connected with Susie Sanchez who was, who got named the director of their high school development program. And so she reached out since Atlanta is a pretty big Mecca for weight, Olympic weightlifting. She reached out and to ask if I could help, um, you know, bring some weightlifters in from the high schools. And so I reached out to coach Bruner Walton's head football coach to see if I could come in and, and, you know, work with the team. 
And so that started out, I was, came in as a volunteer every Wednesday and we had weightlifting Wednesdays and um, everything just kind of snowballed from there. You know, I guess he realized that I knew more than just Olympic weightlifting and asked me to come other days during the week when I was able to, um, you know, to manage it around my schedule at the gym. And then uh, the basketball coach realized what we were doing and he asked me to come. And then coach Amos asked me to come work with the baseball players. And then when we built a new weight room in the school that wasn't out in the, in the field house, um, you know, the other sports sport coaches picked up on it. And um, so now I'm working with most of the sports at Walton. I, I sold the gym um, to be able to do that. That's awesome stuff. That's awesome. <clears throat> So, so now yeah, the, you're. Uh, go ahead, go Tom. Ahead. No, go ahead, Coach Bounce. So my thing is that uh, so we're looking for uh, somebody to to interview every week, you know. And um, I'm scrolling through Twitter and I see you or your son doing squats, who is seven years old. And I'm like, look at this kid go. And so I clicked on you know your profile and I was like, oh, this guy's in high in in Georgia in high school. I was like. This is perfect. Let me reach out to you. So, um, you know, can you take us down that avenue of like, how do you look at a seven-year-old and say, okay, we're going to start you this early. And that's a lot of people's, you know, stereotype, like, oh, do not, do not do weightlifting or strength and conditioning with kids that are that age. Like, how do you, and how do you go about, you know, obviously training your kid to be the strongest kid he can be? Um, I mean, it, it started when he, so when he was like two and a half, I was at home. I always trained at home um, just because I didn't, nobody bothered me. I, you know, I could get my workouts in and, you know, he was two and a half. I set him up in a little corner barricaded away where he wouldn't get hit by anything. And um, I heard some movement behind me and I turned around and he was lifting a, a broomstick um, and it wasn't really bad form. And so, you know, I, I started working with him a little bit with that. Bought him a plastic barbell. Um, he started doing really well with that, squatting really well. I taught him how to do a clean, how to do a power snatch. Because um, at the time I was competing in Olympic weightlifting. And uh, as he started developing and doing really well with it, I started doing some research on it to see, you know, okay, well, how young is too young? And it turns out that I guess the, the main study that everybody always reverts back to um, was in 1999 by Avery Figenbaum um, showing that it's actually not just safe for children to do weight training, but it's actually beneficial for them. It stimulates bone density, it stimulates, stimulates coordination and confidence. Um, and the old myth of it stunting growth and being bad for the, for the, um, the growth plates came from an older study from back, it was either in the 60s or 70s, and it took place over in Asia on, on youth mine workers in China. And that study was actually inconclusive. And um, people just somehow, you know, word spread about it and everybody just aired on the caution side. And it turned out to this, you know, huge wives tale of, you know, if my kid lifts weights, he's going to be short and it's going to stunt his growth when it's actually not the case. Um, you know, so from there, I, you know, I, I started reading that stuff and I bought him a two and a half kilo, which is about five pound barbell. You know, it's, it's pretty much a toy. And, um, you know, I taught him, I taught him how to do the lifts with that. And he came with me to Ohio for the American open in 2017 when he was four and he was doing clean and jerks and snatches with me in the training hall. And a couple of guys that were high up with USA weightlifting, um, saw it and came over and started talking to me. And so he just kind of snowballed from there. Um, he did his first USA weightlifting meet when he was four years old, which was a record. Like they had to actually manually input all of his data and system to <laughs> get him a membership. Um, you know, and, and, and since then he's won state championships in Georgia and in Tennessee for, for Olympic weightlifting. Um, you know, and, and he's a different story. Like, I mean, Lee is a very unique athlete. Um, he's a natural at pretty much everything he does. Um, my, my younger son, who's now for Alex, um, you know, he doesn't have that gene, I guess. I mean, he's, he's not a bad athlete. He's, he's just, he's your normal kid. And, um, you know, he, he doesn't have the coordination or, um, you know, the motor neuron control to figure out how to do a clean, even when I sit there and walk him through it. 
Um, so all he's doing right now is squat and he's gotten really good at it. He's had a couple of videos um, squatting half his body weight, which let's see, he did, he did 20, he did like 20 pounds for three reps. Oh, and, wow. and I mean, it was perfect for him. I, I won't let him go more than, more than half his body weight. So, you know, when he gets to 50 pounds, I'll let him go to 25 pounds. Um, with Lee, he's now seven. I limit him to, to 105% of his body weight. So he's, you know, he, he's 55 pounds roughly. He did 60 pounds in the video that you saw. I think, I think that was the video you saw. I know he did 60 pounds uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, and I, and I post, I post those videos on Twitter, you know, to, to help get the actual truth out there that, Hey, this is okay. Um, you know, and I've, I've learned, I've learned over posting those videos that I need to cite actual research because there is 20 years of, of, you know, peer reviewed research out there supporting youth weight training. Um, you know, but when to start it, it's, there's so many variables, you know, the kid has to be able to comprehend what they're doing. They have to be able to adjust to, to the coaching cues that you give them. They've got to have the attention span to actually learn it. And it's gotta be something they want to do. Like with either one of my, my boys, I never ask them, Hey, Lee, let's go lift. You know, it, it's always, you know, Hey, I'm going down to the weight room. Cause I have a weight room in the house and they're like, Hey daddy, you know, can I come and squat or Hey daddy, can I come and clean? Um, you know, and then that's when I'll bring them down there or, you know, half the time I'll have, I'll have someone over lifting and, and, um, or I'll be lifting and the two, the two boys will just, you know, they'll walk down there and Hey, can, can we squat? So you basically know. you modeled the behavior and then they just took off on their own. Exactly. And steering. Yeah. Them and, and I mean, like Alex, when he first started, like, I mean, there was the first time he asked to do it, you know, I, I gave him the plastic bar and I didn't like what I saw. So I stopped him and, you know, we tabled it for a while. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be up to each athlete on when they're ready to, to actually do it. And then he finally came around and, and kept asking and, you know, he's, he's matured and, you know, can follow directions better now. And, um, you know, now he's doing really well with it. I think he's, he's probably getting close to the point where I can start teaching him how to do a clean. Uh, I, I, real quick, I just think it's hearing you talk about how people um, have this preconceived notion of lifting being bad. Uh, I think that really relates to baseball to a certain extent as well, because as a pitcher growing up when I was younger and, and getting in, even getting into high school and even, even into college when I was getting into college, pitchers didn't lift. Uh, like other sports and, and other athletes did. And I think that's – you see some of the guys in the big leagues that are just yep. monsters, just phenomenal athletes. I think that's also starting to change with the research that's out and all the things. So it, it's crazy how we hear something early in our lives or something that we think may be true, but if we just take a little bit of time to, to look at the research and, like you say, read the research, look at the peer-reviewed articles um, – we actually see that some of these things may not be true. And that's difficult for us as coaches uh, to admit that what we've always known and what we've always done may not be the best way to do it. Um, how do you go about getting guys to let go of a little bit of what they've always done and, and get into some of this new lifting? You know, I, I think, I mean, especially baseball, it, baseball and basketball are the two sports that, I've, I've at least experienced and talking to other coaches, um, not just at the high school level, but at college and, and pros as well, they experience the biggest resistance against lifting from those two sports. Um, you know, and, and I think it's for different reasons between the two sports. Um, you know, but like at Walton, like when, when we get a kid coming in, oh, well, you know, I heard or so, so and so told me that, you know, I shouldn't be doing cleans because I'm a pitcher. Well, okay. Why? You know, and I mean, I've, I've gotten all kinds of answers to that, to that question. Um, you know, and then I'll, I'll generally explain it to them. Well, you know, do you need to be powerful? Well, yeah, of course I do. Okay. So do you, you know, and then I'll go to the board and I'll, I'll draw, you know, I'll draw a graph and, you know, the X and Y axis. And I'm like, okay, well, do you know what power is? Well, no. Okay. Well, it's force times velocity. Yeah, so I'll draw the little, the little curve. I'll say, okay, so, you know, if you squat, which end of this are you moving? You know, and, well, I'll, you know, I'll walk them through the, the whole example. 
and then I'll say, okay, so to move this entire curve up and to the right, so you're more powerful, you agree that we have to, we have to increase the numbers on both axes? And the answer is yes. And I say, okay, so I can give you and I'll li you know, list a ton of exercises that increase force and I'll list a ton of exercises that increase the velocity. And I'll say, or what if we can do this all in one exercise? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, a clean. You know, a clean is force and velocity. And um, I, so I guess backtracking just to, just to, for a second on it, I was an assistant coach when I owned, when I owned my gym and I was competing in, in, in weightlifting. I was an assistant coach for the USA weightlifting level one coaches course. And in that course, um, and I don't know if I'm assuming it's still there. I haven't, I haven't asked anybody since I stopped um, doing that, but there was a, there was a chart of common exercises in the weight room and how much power output each one did. Right. And so snatch is going to have the highest power output rating followed by a clean, followed by a jerk. And then there's a big drop off for everything else. And so, you know, then, then the, you know, I'll, I'll reference that to them. And then the question is, well, why don't we snatch? Why do we clean? And then, it, then it comes into, well, the, the increase or the, the extra power that you're going to be developing from the snatch versus the clean is so negligible when the injury rate or injury risk is a lot higher for the snatch because you're going overhead and, you know, and catching it, you know, overhead and um, you know, where the clean is very safe. Like, I mean, I've been involved in Olympic weightlifting for 30 years and recently I, I saw my first injury on, on the catch of a clean. So the whole, the whole concept and, and, you know, I guess defense that some coaches use of, well, the catch is dangerous. Well, sure. Anything's dangerous if you don't teach it properly. But if you teach it properly and you teach it unloaded to begin with and get the kids getting in a, in a natural good position on the catch, they're not going to get hurt. Um, you know, the one, the one injury that I saw with it was with a football player and his meniscus went on a, on a heavy, heavy clean. And, you know, the, the doctor came back and said, look, it, it would have happened if he was doing a squat. Um, you know, it was just, it was ready to go. Uh, but I mean, as far as like injury risks and, and stuff, if you teach it properly, the clean is, is one of the most efficient and safe exercises you can do in the weight room. And, and I think, I think just talking, listening to you talk about this is the big thing that I hear is teaching it properly and, right. and, and knowing, knowing the lifts. I think a lot of people that come on Twitter or whatever it may be just in general, and you know, weightlifting is a big one is they don't know the information behind it. And so, or the teachings and they want this quick fix. So they're quick to say, this isn't going to work because they have to have a long time to kind of learn the lifts and grow in the weight room where, you know, it's just that automatic, like, oh, this is, this is dumb because one, they don't really know the knowledge behind it, but two, they just want that quick fix of attacking um, different things, whatever it may be inside of baseball, weightlifting, whatever right. it may be. So, well, and and they've got to also factor in too. Every athlete's gonna gonna pick stuff up on it at a different pace, right? I mean, I've had kids that have never done a clean, go through one day of the progressions and clean 65, 70 pounds, perfectly fine. Um, I've had other kids where it's taken about a month, you know, or longer to even get remotely good to the position where we can actually say, okay, let's go, let's let's leave the progressions and and go do a clean. Yeah. And so you just got to be able to you know, dedicate the time that the athlete needs and understand that, you know, you might have to have different progressions going on at the same time in the weight room in the team setting and be able to manage that to get the kids where you need them to be. Now, let me ask you this. So you're at, you're at the high school and we're, we're talking about uh, the age range and all that. Are you guys, are you connected to the middle schools with the weightlifting or do you not get yeah, them until no. they get to the high school or is that like a big thing? Let's, let's get them early and teach those lifts in the middle school and get them start going. So when they get to the high school, they're, they're ready to go. Yeah. So some sports do that. Um, like football, we have a whole, um, we, coach Brenner and I started it last, last year. Um, you know, obviously got cut short with COVID. Um, but it was, a, it was a middle school program. So we had, for, uh, we started a couple of fifth, fifth graders cause they were rising sixth graders. Um, you know, where they came in twice a week in our weight room and, and I'd work with them. And when there'd be a baseball conflict, then, then coach Bruner would work with them on it. 
Um, I've got a lot of the lacrosse, the middle school lacrosse players, the boys come to me and, and we do work on the side um, to get them ready. The other sports haven't, we, you know, like baseball and basketball hasn't really started doing that yet. Um, I think basketball is probably going to pretty soon because um, we had a lot, of, a lot of success in the weight room and, and developing that program. Guys, not to jump in here, but 20 years of being in high school, Walton High School's lucky. They've got a guy like Chris in their weight room. North of County, we're lucky. We've got Will Peters. There's other schools out there that have these good strength coaches because coach can tell you a clean's not an easy thing to pick up. It's something that has to be taught. Sometimes it takes kids a while to figure it out. Most weight rooms at high schools are run by somebody who knows how to lift but may not necessarily know how to teach lifting. And there's a big difference. Uh, somebody who can actually break the movements down for a young athlete, make them understand what they need to do to do that lift safely. Uh, that's why you're, you're listening to coach talk right here. And, and there's a reason why Walton Athletics is successful. It's because teachings not only happen in the classroom and on the field, but it's also happening in the weight room in their athletic program. Yeah, thank you, I, I appreciate, appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, so, so let's, let's kind of talk, uh, in, in direction of baseball. So a, a player comes into the high school in ninth grade. Um, can you kind of just, uh, let's start kind of broader. So like, what's kind of like a plan from a ninth grade till they graduate their senior year? What, what kind of does that overall look like? And then we'll kind of look into like what the season kind of looks like or what a, a year looks like for a kid. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's going to be a little bit different this year, um, just, you know, because of COVID and stuff. Um, but generally in, in the let's, fall. Let's, coach, let's do a non-COVID year. Non -COVID. We're over COVID. <laughs> Everybody's all, right. we're all over we're, it. We're, we're going we're gonna to skip over this one. We're, so, we're, yeah. so in the fall, um, you know, I'd be working with the, you know, for baseball, all the grades are going to be in, in one class in the weight room. Um, so, the the varsity guys that have been in the program for a couple of years, their workout's going to be on the board. They'll all warm up together. Um, I, I have both workouts broken down on the board. Um, and then the varsity guys will go over with Coach Amos, and they'll start their workout. And I'll start teaching the, the JV and freshman kids that have just come in, or I guess the ninth and 10th graders that have just come in, um, you know, start teaching them the movements and stuff. And I'll base that on what the varsity kids are doing that day. So if varsity kids main lift for the day is going to be, you know, a squat, then I'm going to teach them the squat. If their if their main lift for the day is going to be a, a, a clean, I'm going to teach them the clean. Um, you know, and this year I was really lucky. I had, I had three really good interns, um, two of which had college coaching experience. And basically with the whole COVID situation, they didn't have anywhere to coach. Um, you know, so I had, I had Oglethorpe's strength and conditioning coach working with me and I had one of Harvard, um, Harvard's strength and conditioning interns down here working with me. And so I was able to break it up even more this year. And since I trusted those two ladies, you know, we just broke it down in the groups and say, okay, Angela, you go over here and take this group. I'll take this group, Jen, you go take that group. Um, and then, and then our high school intern kind of floated around and, you know, helped out where she could. Um, that being said, you know, I don't know what I'm going to have next year. So it could be a whole different story. Um, and both of those girls are now back at their schools. So, you know, Angela's back up in Boston starting this week and Oglethorpe's back in. So Jen's with them. So I might be on my own this coming semester. Um, so, you know, it would just be me and coach Amos in there with them, but now everybody's at least had the basics. So all the kids have been taught how to do the lifts, you know, we're comfortable with them. We know who's weak in what areas. I mean, I've got some kids that are still squatting with their heels up on plates. You know, I, I think one of the hardest things, even being at Walton, is getting the kids to buy the right shoes. You know, I mean, they come in, they, they come in and they want to, they want to, they want to deadlift, you know, wearing their Air Maxes. And I'm like, well, you know, that's a $220 shoe. Like, do you want to pop the bubble? <laughs> you know, um, you know, and, and so trying, you know, getting them to take their shoes off, understanding that, okay, you know, if I want to apply a lot of force into the floor, I don't want to be pushing into a soft surface, you know, and so getting them in the right shoes or barefoot, you know, is, is a big deal. And then even barefoot, some of the kids can't, 
squat and keep their heels down very well, or they pronate their foot, you know, their feet when they're when they're squatting. So then I've got to put the plates in there, put a couple other tactile, um, you know, cues in there. Like one of our really good players um, from last year, he was junior and he transferred in. He was having some trouble squatting and and he was his his feet were rolling in, and so I went over to the office and I got a couple of pens and put them under his feet on the outside. And I said, Hey, when you squat, I want you to shatter these pens. And he's like, well, coach, it's going to make a mess. And I said, I don't think you're going to be able to do it anyway. You know, <laughs> squat and try to try to smash the pens. And so just by doing that, you know, he quickly understood how to actually keep his whole foot down on the ground. And, and that worked for him. Um, you know, other kids, that kind of cue doesn't work as well. And you just have to kind of learn, you know, how to, how to get through to them and, and how to retrain their, their, their motor patterns to, um, to do it properly. Um, you know, Coach Romano, right yeah. oh, sorry. Coach Romano, you can appreciate this. We were years ago, we were deadlifting and squatting with a class in there and, and an administrator walked in and made everybody put their shoes on because it was a safety hazard. And we're like, look, this is, this is part of the weight room. This is how you <laughs> right. teach. And this is what you have to do. And Oh, no, 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 no. These children are going to get hurt. And, you know, so, so not everybody understand what it takes to lift in a weight room. Oh no, I I know, and I mean I had some of the, some of the sport coaches when I first would have kids take their shoes off. They're like, they're like, oh coach, uh, you know, what are you doing? Like the safety hazard. And I'm like, well, sure. Do you want? Would you rather risk them dropping a plate on their foot, or would, would you rather rather them blowing out a knee ligament? You know, I mean, your choice. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'll I'll take the dropped you know change plate on the foot any day over the over the ligament. Now, when you're teaching the squat or say the power clean. Generally, you know, you're not going to use a 45 pound bar. What, what type of training apparatus are you going to use or what moves or maybe, you know, uh, a goblet squat or something like that to lead that young athlete into those movements? Yeah. So I'll, I'll usually, well, I'll start with a body weight squat um, to begin with. Um, in the fall semester, our PVCs are for whatever reason down at the football field. So I, I can't use those to assess movement. Um, in the spring, I've got them up in the weight room. So I'll do an overhead squat. Just because with overhead squat, I can pretty much assess almost every joint. Now, um, now explain explain to people when you talk about the overhead squat with the PVC, and I understand so, what you're looking for, but explain to explain to our listeners what you're looking for with those athletes. Okay, so an overhead squat, you're you're gonna ideally hold the bar over the center of your head um, with your elbows locked out and be able to squat to full depth. Uh, maintaining your torso straight up, um, you know, perpendicular to the floor. And so with that, you can see a lot of hip and ankle mobility issues. You can see some shoulder issues. Um, you know, I guess one thing that I see a lot with some pitchers generally on that um, is I'll see some hip rotation. Um, you know, they'll rotate at the hip to kind of comp to kind of make up for some shoulder issues to be able to keep their torso straight. Um, you know, and by watching that, I can already tell where I'm going to have to, you know, who, who's going to need the change plates under, under their feet, who's going to need to take their shoes off, um, you know, who potentially has some shoulder issues, who's got some hip issues, lower back issues, um, you know, just having them do 10, 10 warm-up reps of an overhead squat, I, I can tell a whole lot about what I'm going to need to do. Um, you know, we, we do have the F, you know, I'm, I'm FMS certified um, and in, the, in the fall, for our fall sports, I was able to get the interns to run FMS um, tests on, on our athletes. Um, this year, I mean, everything was thrown off. I, I, we haven't done that with the spring sports or the, or the winter sports yet. Um, you know, ideally towards the end of the semester, I'll get some, you know, I'll get some data on that. And then over the summer when they're doing their summer workouts, you know, we can, we can keep an eye on that for next year. Um, but I really do like the FMS and that, that's something that I, I wasn't always big on, but when I was with the Dodgers, I learned a lot about it and how it applies to baseball. Can you tell explain people, about that? Yeah, can you explain yeah. about that just a little bit? The tell, FMS, tell about, so, yeah, what FMS is. So it's functional movement systems. And it, it basically, it, it's a test for muscular imbalances. So it, a lot of people think it's a mobility test and it's not. It, it's, it's giving a score of, of zero to three on certain movements. So for example, the overhead squats, the the first movement that you test with it. And if they can squat with their, with their heels on the ground to proper depth, torso up, elbows locked out and the bar over the center of their head, then they would get a three. 
if their heels come up, which is generally the first problem that you see, then they have to put the board under their, under their feet or under their ankles, and then they retest it. And if they're, if they're successful with that lift, then they get a two. If they can't do it, then they're going to get a one. If there's any pain, you get a zero. So it, it, like, it, it tests everything in all the different planes. Um, you know, it, it's got some rotational tests in it. Um, and then it's got one test that I don't use for baseball. Um, you know, I, and this was, uh, you know, Brandon, the, the head strength coach of the Dodgers, um, explained it to me that you're not going to really see very many people get a three on it. And so it kind of takes the, the value of that test out. So you just kind of have to recalculate the scores because the, a perfect, a perfect score of somebody that doesn't have any muscular imbalances is, is going to be a 21. You've got seven tests, seven times three is 21. Um, you know, so if you scored out of the 18, it'll give you a grade. And if you have their app and you pay for their program, it'll give you, based on where, where you were um, deficient on the scores, it'll give you corrective exercises and it'll email those to the individual athlete. So ideally in that situation, like what I did with football over the summer, or I guess, yeah, towards the end of the summer, was each kid got there, got that email. And then on Wednesdays, they had time allotted to work on their, correct, their corrective exercises after practice. Um, you know, so at Walton, we have Web Wednesdays um, in school, which, is, you know, it's a, a short day. The kids get out, I think it's like at 12.15 or 12.30. Um, you know, so e each class period is, I want to say it's like 33 minutes. So by the time they change out for the weight room, get warmed up, it's almost ready. You know, we can get one lift in type, type thing, you know, and then they have to go change out. So like ideally when I was planning this out, Wednesdays would have been the day for most of the sports to work on their FMS stuff. Um, you know, just, it didn't work out that way this year though. Um, I listening to you talk about movement and uh, the importance of flexibility and, and doing these kind of things again, makes me think about how much I've missed out on training as I've grown. And even as I've taught uh, athletes that I've coached, flexibility and movement may be the most uh, underutilized, undertaught, underconsidered aspect in athletics. What would you say the balance is between pushing that strength versus fixing that flexibility so that they can actually do the lifts the proper way? I think, I think the, flex, the, the movement pattern has to come first, all right? And it, to me, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's a ninth grader that might never play varsity or if it's your top athlete. Um, you know, for example, and, and there's one major league team. So the Dodgers have their setup very different than any other team that I'm aware of. Um, they have Eric on their staff who he's – part of their sports performance staff, but he's also a scout. So here you have, you have somebody like me that is a scout as well, that he'll go and he'll analyze the movement patterns of the, of the kids that they're looking to draft. Um, you know, and they don't care how much the kid can squat, how much the kid can, you know, can deadlift or anything like that. Um, at that level, they're more, you know, for the lifts, they're looking at velocity base training as opposed to actual, you know, one rep, three rep max type numbers anyway. But for them, the movement patterns, the primary thing, because a poor movement pattern, the athlete's going to be more likely to get hurt. And, you know, if you're, if you've got a kid that's, that's looking to play at the next level, you know, whether it's college or, or, you know, going straight to the draft or, or, you know, going to college and then maybe the draft, that's at least like a, you know, four to eight year projection. So this kid's got to stay healthy over that time frame, not just the four years that you've got him at, at the high school. So the movement pattern, I mean, to me, that's number one. Like, I mean, I, I tell the kids all the time, I don't care how much weight's on the bar. I care about you getting progress and getting stronger and more powerful through the right movement pattern. So you're not going to get hurt because what I think what a lot of coaches and, and I know most of the kids, they don't understand like, I mean, the, the primary thing in the weight room to them is getting stronger, getting faster, getting more powerful. You know, for me, it's preventing injuries in the future. Then take the, the stronger, powerful, you know, faster stuff as a secondary. Because if your athlete's getting hurt, it doesn't matter. I mean, if the kid squats 500 pounds, great. But if he's out half the season, what good is that going to do? 
That's taking but, your uh, economics background into account too. And saying, okay, <laughs> oh, yeah, so it does. It does. And that's, that's not the first time that I heard that. Yeah, it's a, it's a benefit. So talk about, you, you just talked about velocity rep versus max rep. Can you, can, can you elaborate on that just a little bit? What, what that means? Sure. So a lot of high, I mean, a lot of high schools don't have access to it. And I mean, I've been asked, I've been hoping at Walton that we can get it. Um, and we haven't been able to do it yet. Um, but what it is, so you've got a couple of different brands that make, make the velocity, uh, I don't want to call them testers or whatever, but the devices, you've got push band, which it actually, it, it's, it's a Velcro strap that you put on the bar and it'll measure the speed from start to finish of the movement. Um, Tendo unit is, is a big one at the college level. It actually attaches to the, to the bar and it looks like a little string that hangs off the bar. And so it's, it's measured, both, either one of them are measuring bar speed. So if you take, take a deadlift, for example, because that's one of the main lifts that you're going to see with, with velocity-based training, it'll give, you a, it'll give you the speed in meters per second from the floor to, the, to, the, you know, to when the bar stops. So you can program in, instead of you know, saying, okay, we're going to go five sets of five, you know, your first set's going to be 65%, then you're going to go 75%, you know, and on like that, say, okay, we're going to go sets of five, until the bar goes slower than 0.6 meters per second. And that's actually, I'll, I'll share the story. I'm not going to say which team it was with or, or who, who the athlete was, but um, when I was interning with one of the, one of the pro teams, it was going into the all-star break and one of the, one of their pitchers, uh, a high prospect came in to the weight room and he's like, Hey, you know, can I get after it today? Well, his brother plays D1 college football. So the guy knows how to lift. And uh, the, the head strength coach goes, well, what, you know, what do you mean by get after it today? And he goes, well, I, I want a deadlift. You know, I'm thinking maybe, you know, three by three at 505. And so the head strength coach goes, okay, well, as long as the bar stays moving faster than 0.7 meters per second, I'm good with it. And so that pitcher got after it and all three sets were well above that 0.75. So that just shows, it's going to show, it's going to, you're going to get the effort that you want out of the athlete because for him, 505 isn't that heavy. I mean, it's, it's heavy, but it's not, you know, it's probably for him, I would guess that was probably about maybe 75%, 80% of what he could do, right. For one, but he was having to go all out to keep that speed up. You want faster athletes. That's the way to go about it. And you're going to get the similar stimulus. I mean, his, his, his muscles are going to be pretty much just as tired um, and just as work as if he went heavy for a couple of sets of three, but it's at a lighter load. So it's going to be actually less wear and tear on the body. Um, and I've got, I've got that push band at home. And so I brought it in a few times for, for our kicker and over, over the fall, like over the preseason, we, we trained with that. And so he was doing the velocity based training and I mean, he put several balls uh, on the, on the kickoff through the uprights. Um, wow. You know, so, it, I mean, he, he credited that with, for a lot of it, um, you know, just doing that VBT stuff. So it's just teaching more explosive, quicker, explosive production instead of that long strain of lifting the right. weight. Is that, is that what we're right. getting yeah. to? I mean, if, if you want fast athletes, you have to train fast. Yeah. You know, a slow movement, yeah, sure, it's going to build strength, but is it going to actually get you more explosive? Um, you know, and that goes to the whole thing of, you know, is there a such thing as too strong? And, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in there is. What is that where you, what would you say too strong is? They start losing flexibility, they can't. No, I, I would just say that the benefit, so like, let's say you've got, a, let's say you've got a, a catcher and, he can, he can back squat two and a half times his body weight. The amount of time that you're going to put in to get him stronger from that point could be much better spent building him, you know, power or speed or, you know, something else. It, it's just the time that you've got to spend in it isn't worth it at that point. Return because you're going, have, you're going to have, you're going to have small, small returns. Yeah, there you go. Back to your economics. Return on investment. Is that what we're... <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 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 Matt just <laughs> said it. <laughs> um, so, so let, let's just break down. So we have 
position player and we have pitcher. When you bring those guys into the program, how does how does that start building for one? Let, let's just take a look at like position players. What is your idea um, of what a position player should be strength wise, and what what do you kind of do to get those guys to that position? I mean, when when they first come in, for the most part, their their program is going to be the same. Um, I mean, there's gonna there's gonna be some stuff that I'm gonna have a pitcher do versus a position player. Um, you know, we do we do a thing a three way shoulders routine um, a couple times a week that I'll have the pitch the pitchers will focus more on the rotator cuff um, as opposed to actually building strength in the shoulders. Um, you know, bench press. You know, I've got a couple kids that they just I mean they'll do anything they can to bench press, and you know I'm okay. I'm okay with a, a position player bench pressing as long as they're doing a two movement, two back movements for that one chest movement, right? Because, and, and here we go. I mean, this kind of gets into another baseball myth of, um, you know, baseball players shouldn't bench press, you know, and it's, it's not that they shouldn't bench press. It's, you don't, if, if you develop the pecs, it's going to bring your shoulders forward. And so you want to make sure that you're countering that, with back exercises to make sure that the shoulders stay in the position that they need to stay in. You know, and I'm not talking about going heavy. Like I wouldn't have a, a baseball, I wouldn't suggest a baseball player, you know, try to one rep max a bench press. You know, there's just no, no need for putting that strain on the, on the shoulders, but the actual movement itself is fine. Um, I'm not aware of any pro team or, or college team from the coaches that I've talked to that don't even do like a dumbbell bench press. You know, yeah. most, most will do a dumbbell bench. Um, you know, the Dodgers kind of do a, uh, they put their shoulders on a bench and they'll do one arm bench press with the dumbbell, um, you know, with their, their knees are at a 90 degree angle and then, you know, their butt's not touching anything, the back's not touching anything and their shoulders are on the bench. So they're having to engage the core and the glutes a little bit more. Um, you know, and I really like that for pitchers, um, you know, but that's kind of the, you know, at the very beginning, I'm just trying to, you know, ninth grade when they come in, I'm just trying to build strength. Yeah. Um, you know, build movement patterns. You know, if, if they can, if they can back squat, great. If, if they can't back squat and they can goblet squat, then that's fantastic. Cause I'm still, I'm still teaching them that movement pattern. What, uh, so what we, we're talking about deadlifting and, and back squat and all that. What, what are your main lifts that you feel that are, what you're going to teach when you're inside the weight room for, for baseball players. So my main, my main lifts are going to, are going to be either a back squat or a front squat. Um, I'm going to prefer a back squat because they're going to do cleans anyway. And so they're getting that front, that front position in there. Um, you know, and back squat works different muscles than a front squat does, but if they're cleaning, they're still getting their quads and they're still getting their, their lower back muscles in that the front squat would get through that clean. Um, because I'm going to ha have them do a full clean and not a power clean. Um, so that's, that's two days right there, right? You got your squat, you got your clean. Um, deadlift will be, will be one of the days. And then, and then a pressing movement. Um, you know, so it might, be, it might be a dumbbell bench one week. It might be a, a dumbbell shoulder press the next week. Um, you know, I try to vary that. But those are going to be the core lifts. And then everything else is going to be the accessories. Uh, I'm going to ask kind of a kind of a fun question that you may not have a direct answer to, but uh, the 90 mile an hour fastball is obviously something that's becoming a lot more common now. Um, mm -hmm. We have this discussion sometimes and we're just sitting around uh, what lift, what single lift would correlate the most to a high velocity fastball? Single core lift, I would say would be a clean. Cause you're, you're getting that, you're getting that, that force and that velocity. Um, you know, if, you if, you said, if, you said, if, 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 if you said that you're completely opposed to a clean, then I would say a velocity based deadlift. The velocity based lifting is, I, I've actually, I don't know that I've ever heard of that until we were just talking about it earlier. Uh, you know, you went from, we'd go run miles as pitchers, you'd go run long distance and, and then it turns to sprints, you know, do you want to be able to sprint or do you want to be able to run? Well, I want to be able to sprint because if I throw 80 pitches, I'm throwing 80 sprints. Well, that's the, uh, the same concept with this velocity-based uh, training 
is that we're trying to get more explosive and we're doing short burst versus maybe a little more extended, extended. Um, See, and, and that, like, that comment kind of reminds me about, I mean, like one of the biggest, one of the biggest issues that I see at high school, or, you know, at least that I talk to with other high school coaches that don't have the scientific background is the bioenergetics of the individual sports, right? Meaning, and, and that's kind of where you were talking, like, you know, baseball used to go out and run a couple miles. Well, that's the aerobic energy system. We don't touch that in baseball. I mean, very rarely would you touch that in baseball, right? And I've had to have this conversation with a lot of my younger baseball players, you know, mainly ninth and 10th graders, um, and a couple of coaches a, as well. I, I coach travel ball as well, um, a 14U team. Um, you know, and the parents are like, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to send them out for a two mile run today. I'm like, no, please, please don't do that. <laughs> You're going you're gonna, to, you're, everything that we're working on to get more powerful and faster, you're going to make the kids slower. Um, you know, I, I've got to say it nicely to the, to, to the parents, um, but that's the gist of it, right? Because, I mean, what's the longest play that we would see in a baseball game? You know, an inside the park home run? Yeah. And, I mean. And that's rare. It's rare, right? Probably, yeah. I mean, more commonly, you know, the longest play you're going to have is, is probably a double. Yeah. Well, you know, you've got three primary energy, well, you've got three energy systems. You've got your creatine phosphagen energy system, which is the, the short explosive stuff that at all out work capacity after 10 seconds, that, that, that energy system's diminished. And then you switch over to your glycolic system, which runs off of sugar, and that's good for about 90 seconds. Well, there's nothing in baseball that lasts 90 seconds. You know, and, and a 90 second point is where your aerobic system's gonna take over. Um, you know, and pitching, would be the only thing that really was even going to need the glycolic system because you're going to be explosive for, you know, what, maybe two seconds. And then you've got a good minute to recover. So that creatine phosphagen system is going to pretty much fully recover before your next pitch. You know, now if you're out there for a really long inning and, and stuff, then, you know, then, then we can run into some, you know, some turnover there, but for the most part, you know, that's why you don't want to do the long running in baseball. Well, I always said, look at, look at um, cross country runners to sprint runners, look at their legs, look at their lower half, look at the difference. You know, you got guys that run cross country that are like skinny, small legs because they're wearing and tearing on that muscle and, and getting depleting it. Whereas you got sprinters that are building up for those quick explosive uh, movements. Exactly. And, and it's different muscle fibers that, that are used for that. Right. I mean, your, your type one muscle fibers are going to be the slow ones that, you know, your cross country runners are going to, going to need to develop and your your fast twitch muscles are going to be the ones that your explosive athletes like a baseball player or you know bas basketball for the most part um you know football is going to is going to use are there fast twitch athletes versus slow twitch athletes or is that something Absolutely. that can be developed more you can develop about? it yeah you can develop it um you know and that's just like if you know i mean coach amos and i were talking about it briefly today you know, when I made the comment of, I hope none of our kids are just going out and running. Like, I hope they're actually lifting over the break. Um, you know, and that's, and let's take a kid that doesn't know any better. And he's like, all right, I'm going to go run three miles a day over Christmas break because we're not in the weight room, you know, and I need to get my exercise. Well, when that kid comes back, he's going to be a lot less powerful and he's going to be slower. You know, he's developing the wrong kind of muscle. Yeah. And he's building, uh, and he's building the wrong, wrong energy systems too. So tie that into like nutrition wise, like <clears throat> what do you recommend there as far as, <clears throat> okay. How much, time, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, I mean, I've, go forever, I've, coach. <laughs> I've broken it down. It, it keeps getting erased. I don't know who keeps erasing it at school. I keep writing it up there on the, on one of our boards though in the weight room. I've got it broken down by time on the ideal uh, percentages to eat of your macronutrients. You know, for a morning strength session and after in an afternoon practice or um, a game. You know, I've got I've got different charts with different time scenarios and everything on it um, for the kids. Do they follow it? Most of them no, but I do get enough questions from them on it randomly that I know they're paying attention and they're at least trying, or at least some of them are trying. You know, um, for example, with that, 
you know, you've got, you've got your macronutrients, you've got your protein, your fat, and your carbs, right? And your carbs are, well, carbs and protein are the important ones for athletes, right? If you have an athlete that doesn't want to eat carbs, I mean, you, you got your work cut out for you because they're not going to, they're not going to be able to develop that speed and that explosiveness because that, that kind of energy comes out of the carbs. Um, the carbs transport the protein molecules to the muscles that need them, right? So it's important to have a high glycemic carb that's going to be fast absorbed by your body right before and right after a workout when you take your protein. Because otherwise you're putting protein in your body, but your muscles aren't getting them. And it's either going to just get stored. So you're putting on excess weight or you're going to, you're going to pee it out. Um, you know, it's, and it's not worth taking it at that point. Um, you know, I'll get into a discussion with them on the difference between the high glycemic and the low glycemic carbs as well. You know, if, if you have a afternoon strength session and then you go to practice, you know, in the morning, you need to have a low glycemic carb so that energy lasts you all day. Um, you know, and then in between the, the strength in between your weight training class and practice, you've got to have a high glycemic carb and your protein. This way you're replenished before practice, you know, and other than the kids that like we had one pitcher last year that had, um, our general weight, weight training class to seventh period. And he couldn't, with his schedule, he couldn't get in any, any of the athlete sessions. So he had seventh period and then he had to come straight to practice. Um, you know, and that there, there really wasn't a lot we could do nutrition wise with that. Um, other than try to prepare him before the weight training class board. Um, you know, but as long as they have six period or earlier nutritionally, I can have them ready for, for the practice after school, you know, pregame meals. That's a whole nother story. Um, that I've had some discussions with. Now, coach, when, when you talk about nutrition and high school athletes, most of the time we get athletes walking in, it's, it's, it's gain weight. We've got to get stronger. We've got to get bigger, but it's weight. We call those kids hard gainers because it's that freshman who's 135 pounds, 120 pounds. How do you get that kid to take genetics out of play? But, mm -hmm. but how can you get that kid to eat more? What does he need to eat? And, and, and what, how many times a day does that athlete need to eat to go from that hard gainer to start to give his body what he needs to, 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 to receive the work he's doing in the weight room. And that's the hard part about high school athletes, because I mean, you've got to kind of do it around class and around, I mean, I'm sure like your school might have different rules in our school about like eating and stuff in class. Um, you know, but ideally they would, they would have six food intakes a day. And I, I started out, using the term meal and people kind of freak out when I'm, you know, coach, you want me to eat six meals a day? Well, no, I just, I need you to take food in six times a day. Um, you know, and over the course of that day, if they're getting 40% carb, 30% at, you know, at the ninth grade, 10th grade level, 40% carb, 30% protein, 30% fat, you know, and you keep those balances as you increase the calories, you're going to see the weight gain. You know, the problem is, you know, if, if the kid's on a limited diet, um, like I mean, we've got, we've got a vegan on the team, you know, and I mean, probably, I'm probably giving too much detail than, than what most coaches are going to want to hear, but like leucine, for example, is one of the branch chain amino acids that's extremely important for building muscle. Well, it's only found in meats. So you know, convincing him, okay, you need to go out and find a leucine supplement. Well, I mean, that doesn't sound very attractive for him, right? So the odds of him doing that, <laughs> it's not like I'm telling him to go out and get a C4, you know, pre-workout, because I guarantee you the kid would go out and get that. Oh, they love that pre-workout. Right. <laughs> Which that's a whole other story um, <laughs> that, I've got to, that I've got to fight with with some of the kids. Um, you know, but, but trying to get their macronutrients and their micronutrients and, and, and get everything on point at the high school level is so difficult. Like, I mean, as long as they're getting some of it and they're eating enough, they're going to see the game. I mean, I've got a basketball player right now. that's one of our, one of our top players that refuses to eat breakfast. Um, oh. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having that fight over the last couple of weeks. Um, I, I feel like I'm not winning it. Um, you know, but I've, I've, I've tried as hard as I can. Well, and, and we, we tell our athletes and, and there's training, which is physically tough. I mean, it's tough to get in that weight room and train. It's the hardest thing you're going to do. But for high school athletes, 
eating and sleeping sometimes are the two hardest things when they are the, they're, they're honestly the simplest things to do. Like if you told any five of us here, Hey, you can sleep and eat as much as you want. We would do it. But for a high school athlete, that's the tough part. They'll they'll train, they'll get in there and lift, but to get them to eat the right things and to get the right amount of sleep. uh, That's the, that's the hard part sometimes. You know, the irony of it is even my experience at at the pro level, it's, it's, it's like that. Um, I mean, like take the, you know, do you guys know what whoop bands are? Mm Mm-hmm. So a couple of the pro teams use those and um, collective bargaining agreement won't allow them to require it because in the collective bargaining agreement, they can't, the teams cannot track sleep. They can't, they, they cannot forcibly um, track, track the player's sleeps. So you've got guys out there that they know they're out partying all night. They know that they're not getting the sleep that their coaches want them to. So they won't, they won't wear the bands. Um, you know, it, it's a different reason that the kids in high school won't sleep, but it's the same problem, right? Um, you know, they're not, they're not getting the recovery that they need. You know, I mean, in an academic school like Walton, I mean, our kids have, you know, three, four hours of, of homework a night, you know, the, the kids that are taking advanced classes. So by the time they get back from practice, you know, they've got to eat dinner. Now you're looking at, it's probably, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock. And now you've got three to four hours of homework to do. Well, and then you've got to be up at, at you know, 6 7 a.m. So they're not getting the recovery that they need. Um, you know, so nutrition is going to even play a bigger role in that. And if they're not willing to eat properly, too, I mean, that's, that's just going to lead to problems down the road for them. And, like, uh, I, I, this might be, like, kind of generic, but, like, how do you, when you talk to kids about their eating plan, do you look at it as calories or how, how do you kind of – calculate that to to give them an idea of how much they should be intaking for the kids for the kids i will i'll look at it calories i don't like looking at it calories because i mean the calorie is a unit that's not exact you know a calorie is is basically how much heat it takes to warm a gram of water uh one degree celsius but unless you have um like a bomb chamber you can't test it yeah right so you know, if, if, a, if a nutrition label on, you know, I, I don't know, pick a food, like, you know, say a protein bar. If a nutrition label says it's got, you know, 220 calories in it, that could be off 10% in either direction. You know, and then especially when you're talking about supplements that aren't regulated at all, you, you don't really know. Um, but for simplicity, for the high school kids, they, they understand calories, so I'll talk to them in the calories. And, you know, hope that we're just within that 10% window somewhere. Yeah. You know, but I'll break it down and I'll, I'll break it down in the grams for them so they can actually calculate that way as opposed to just looking at the calories. Because, I mean, 100 calories of one food is not the same as 100 calories of another food. But, you know, 100 grams of high glycemic carb is going to be 100 grams of high glycemic carb. I've got, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a personal question because I tell our athletes eat out of the fridge and not the pantry, you know, because the meats, the cheeses, those things are in, in the fridge and, and versus we have an athlete, we'll, we won't name his name, but everybody knows who it is, but his, his food supplementation had to end in an O. It was a Cheerio, a Dorito, an Oreo. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to get that athlete to to open up the fridge instead of open up the pantry was tough. Well, see another. Uh, I, so a way that I would the way that I would address that is I would go back to that that breakdown of forty percent carb, thirty percent protein, thirty percent fat, because the diet that you just described is going to be much higher than thirty percent fat. So if he if he eats, I mean the Cheerios aren't high in fat, but your Doritos and your Oreos and stuff are, you know if he eats five Oreos, well, he might have just have his whole fat, fat intake for the day. And then he's, then he's not going to, he's not going to be happy for the rest of the day. So he's going to, he knows he's going to have to adjust that for the next day. If you can get him to buy into that plan. Yeah. That's, that's the hard part. So, so it's like yeah. that. It's like that at every level. Good. So 40%. Now, are there, are, oh, go ahead, coach. You got it. I mean, that, that, that 43, 30, is just a very general um, breakdown that I'll use for, you know, just like your younger athletes right so if now. So you adjust it, what, how, what, why would you adjust it and how would you adjust it? 
I would I would adjust it based on the needs of an athlete. So, you know, let's say let's say we've got a, a junior and you know the colleges colleges are saying, okay, you know, this kid needs to gain twenty pounds of muscle before before the end of his senior year. I'm gonna adjust it for that. You know, I'm gonna lower his fat, I'm gonna up his carbs around his food or around his training session, and then I'm gonna up the protein. You know, so you might get into, uh, you know, 20% fat intake, um, you know, maybe 55% carb, you know, and then I'm, I don't have a calculator here. To, I'm not great at math on the top of my head. <laughs> you know, and then the rest of it's going to be protein. But basically, you're going to up the carb, you're going to up the protein, and you're going to lower the fat. Um, you know, if, if I've got a football player, you know, like say a kicker that needs to lose weight, you know, we're going to adjust it, adjust it that way as, uh, or, you know, adjust it differently than the kid that needs to gain muscle. Um, but again, that's just going to be for, you know, specific situations for the older kids, um, you know, that have like, you know, specialized needs to get to the next level. Do you guys you take brought time? Up C- yeah. You, you brought up C4 earlier. That's right. one of the questions we always get with our athletes. Supplements, what to take, what should I take, what can I take? Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of creatine. Um, oh, I'm too. Tell our, oh. and, and, and sometimes – Give us a list of supplements for, not for, say, a middle school athlete, but for an athlete who's, let's just go with a 17-year-old junior. Okay. What supplements outside of food would you recommend to those athletes to take daily, weekly, what, however you would, you would recommend? Assuming they have a proper, like, nutrition balance. Like, if they're, yes. getting, if they're getting proper protein intake, um, you know, then I would, say, I would say creatine would probably be number one. and I know there are probably a lot of coaches and parents that would raise their eyebrow at that, but it, it is one of the most studied supplements out there. Creatine and protein, like whey protein, are the most, the most studied, and caffeine, are the most studied supplements. Um, you know, as long as you don't have any kidney issues in your family and you dose it properly, the creatine, it, the, there really aren't any side effects to it. You know, now if you overdo it, you can definitely do some kidney damage. Um, you know, the, you know, you don't want to. As long as you, you know, you don't want to get into the the ask the idea of more is better with creatine. You know, protein. Yeah, you know, it would you can overdo the protein, but it would be so hard to hit, actually hit that high number that is very unlikely to do. So you know, if the kid wants to take two or three protein shakes in a day. Yeah, it's not ideal but they're probably not going to get sick or, you know, do any like permanent damage to it. But if you're taking, you know, two to three times the, the recommended amount of creatine in a day, you can do damage. Um, I, I laugh at, I laugh at the kids that they or the parents that'll say, I, I don't want my kid to take this supplement, but the kids sitting there holding a Red Bull in their hand or a bang energy yeah. drink. And you're like, you're, you're letting them take that, but yeah, you're worried I mean, about creatine. With the creatine. I mean, what I, I think a lot of people, outside of the science world don't understand is your body, your body produces creatine. Like, I mean, creatine is the primary thing besides phosphagen that are in that explosive energy um, system, right? Your creatine phosphagen energy system is your explosive power, right? If I'm going to go run a, say I'm going to sprint a lap around the track, 400 meters, right? That first, you know, nine to 10 seconds, I'm going to go really fast. And then it's basically, I'm going to feel like I hit a wall and I'm going to slow down. Right. That's when I, that's when my body is depleted of the creatine phosphagen and I'm switching over to glycogen. Um, so now the, the next, you know, 60 seconds or so, I'm going to be running off a glycogen energy system, which is basically sugar. And then if that lap takes me longer than that amount of time, that's when I'm going to hit another wall and I'm going to slow down again. And that's when I'm switching over to the oxygen system. And it takes about three minutes of rest to fully replenish that creatine phosphagen energy system. So your body's producing it all. And, and the way I explain it to the parents and kids that ask is taking the creatine supplement, you're basically just filling up the gas tank in your muscles with the creatine. So that creatine isn't going to make you stronger. It's, that creatine is not going to make you faster. What it's going to do is it's going to move. It's going to slowly and gradually move that time curve down to the right. So you might be able to, you know, build up to 11 seconds before you deplete that system, right? Well, if I can, if, if, 
if I move, if I gain a second more of that explosive power, what is that going to do athletically? Well, in the weight room, I might be able to get another, another rep in, right? If I don't completely drain that system that, you know, I can, I can do a set and then I might be able to get another set in quicker than if, you know, if I didn't have that. So you're, you're able to get a little bit more work in and over time, that little bit more work is going to actually translate over into more strength and more power. Um, you know, as long, again, as long as you dose it properly. Yep. If you overdo now, it, then it, then it can be dangerous. What other supplements besides creatine would you recommend for a high school athlete? I'm good with caffeine. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, BCAAs, you know, there's, there are studies that go both ways. And I mean, there are people that I like BCAAs. I, I'm drinking a BCAA drink right now. Um, <laughs> there are sports scientists that will sit there and, and argue, you know, until we get into a fist fight that I wasted my money on this drink. But if it's a kid that doesn't like drinking water and like, and this tastes good and it's going to get them to drink, you know, four or five of these bottles a day, I'm okay with it because there's no, there's no, there's no detrimental side effect to BCAs. I mean, they're just, they're branch chain amino acids. They're the building block of, of, of protein. Um, you know, so in certain situations, I, you know, I've recommended kids take that. Gotcha. Um, yeah, but that's more for the hydration aspect of it than, than anything else. Um, you know, I've recommended it for a couple of kids that don't like to consume protein. And so I, I you know, and, and they've had trouble gaining weight and muscle. And so, you know, I'm suspicious that they're, they're leucine deficient. Um, you know, and if you get them a BCA that, that has leucine in it, which most of them do, you know, then that'll help them build muscle as well. Gotcha. Do you recommend protein shakes afterwards or before or? Um, yeah, I mean, a couple of our teams do it. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not a, the biggest fan of it, but you know, I mean, nothing's going to be natural food, right? I mean, chicken, you know, salmon, like that's real protein. That's not a supplement and that's always going to be better. But you know, in, in a school setting, you know, if you've got fifth period weight training and you don't, you know, you're not going to walk around, you know, with a bag of chicken in your hand for classes, you know, and you can take a quick protein drink in between classes, you know, that, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Now there's, there's different qualities of protein, right? And so the kids that ask me about the protein drinks, you know, hey coach, is this one good to take? You know, I'll look at, first thing I'll do is I'll look at how many grams of protein are in it. And then I'll look at what kind of protein is it, right? If it's a concentrate protein, they're going to need more grams of it because it's less digestible. Right. If, if it's, if it's a hydrolyzed protein, then they need less grams of it because it's, it's water soluble. Right. And the easy way to test that, if you don't know, is, you know, how hard is it to mix up in a, in, in a bottle of water? Right. If you need to put it in a blender, it's probably not a very good protein. You're probably gonna need a lot of it to be able to absorb some of it. Yeah. I am definitely going to have to go back and listen to this because there's a lot of information. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so just to kind of move along, what, so in the off season, um, can you just real quick kind of talk about off season to in season lifting? What's the big differences for you guys and, and what, what do you try to, or is there even a difference? I guess is the real no, there's a big difference. Yeah. I mean, everything with all of the Walton sports, everything that I do, um, you know, I'm big on periodization. Um, everything that I put in the program, you know, there's a, there's a scientific reason behind it. Um, you know, whether it's pairing different movements together, um, you know, and I'll pair different movements together during the season than I would outside of the season. Um, you know, for example, in season, we don't clean from the floor. We clean from the hang. Um, off season, we'll clean from the floor. Main reason for that is taking it out of the hang for multiple reps is going to have less strain on your, on your central ner nervous system than going from the floor. Right. Because essentially if you're cleaning it from the floor, you're deadlifting it every time. Right. Where if that's not the, if that's not the muscular adaptation that I'm looking for, which in a clean, it normally wouldn't be, I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste their energy on that. Right. So the volume and the training load is going to, is going to come down a lot in season. Now we're still at the high school level. We're still trying to build muscle in season. It's just going to be a lot slower than in the off season. 
Yeah. Um, you know, a, a good example of that too is our squat program, right? So in the off season, you know, I'm, there's going to be a much higher squat volume, you know, um, you know, for example, I feel like last week, I was just talking about this with coach Amos last week was the end of our off season squat cycle. So they had, I think it was, I think they would have had, let's see, they would have gone five at 65%, five at 75%, five at 85%. And then I think they would have gone, they would have dropped down and they would have done like three sets, three sets of 10 at, at 75%. So the volume's a lot higher there. We're, we're going to start when we get back to school, we're going to, it's going to be five sets and that's it. You know, so it, it, it's a lot lighter load. Do you, are you a, are you a one rep max type of person or are you like a, a max or multiple rep max? You know, both. Um, yeah. Both is the answer and it depends on the sport. Um, you know, I'm not opposed to one rep maxes and I'm not opposed to three rep maxes. Um, a lot of it honestly is going to depend on what the sport coach wants. You know, I, I've got a couple of sport coaches that are really, really, really big on one rep max. What do our kids lift? What do our kids lift? Um, you know, but from the, from the sports performance side of it, you know, for most sports, it matters more what they can do for three reps than it does for one rep. Right. Because I mean, other than competitive Olympic weightlifting or competitive powerlifting, you don't need to just do one repetition of something in your sport. You know, you've, you've got to do it over and over and over and over again. Yeah, so I'll kind of base it based on what, what the coach wants. If it's up to me, the, the sports that I don't get any input from the coaches and they just say, you know, here are my kids, run with it, I do, I do three rep maxes with them. And then do, we'll calculate out an estimation for the one rep and program it based off of that. Do you have it where, like, you're at the end of the semester, your guys are rep maxing out to – see where they are assessment wise, or is it kind of just keep building through the um, year and here we are. Again, it's going it's to depend on, on, I mean, the number one primary thing is, is where are we in the season? You know, um, I mean, I wouldn't have football test at the end of the fall, at, uh, at the end of the fall semester, because those kids are already beat up. Um, you know, and there's, there's also, there's a lot of research backing up the fact that for student athletes, the highest, the the time that's got the highest injury risk is final weeks you know so the sports that we did test like i had lacrosse test two weeks ago um just you know i i needed the data for them because we didn't get a ton of training time and yeah. so i didn't have any numbers for them to work with in the fall because by the time Cobb allowed spring sports to come back i didn't have time to build them up test them and then put them through another strength cycle. So the only numbers that I could get for the fall were this were that past week. Um, you know, so but with, with with the spring sports, I probably would have tested it that week anyway on a normal basis. You know, basketball and winter sports, I'm not gonna test them in season. Yeah. Um, one thing that we kind of talked about between us in um text and stuff was we do a lot of drive line, um, kind of the the weighted balls. And you talked about you do more of a medicine ball warm up for the pitchers. Can you just kind of explain to to us what what that is? Yeah, let's see if I. I mean, it's, it's easier to demonstrate it. Um, so for the pitchers, and I and I got this from the Braves. Um, we'll start out the pitching progression. We'll start out with them on one knee, and the, the medicine ball will be in front of their chest, and then they're going to drive off of the ground with their foot that's planted and kind of circle up through their arm slot and fire the ball forward. All right, and so they're going to go through they, – they'll go through three sets of five on each arm, um, and the opposite arm is always not very pretty. <laughs> do it. Um, you know, and, and some of them will be like, Coach, why, why do I have to do it with my, with my left hand? Well, again, it goes back to that muscular balance, right? We want to try to have everything balanced because it's going it's to – you know, it's injury prevention. Um, you know, and then eventually by the end of the season, they, they get the hang of that. Um, so then after they do those sets from the ground, then they're going to do it from, they're going to do it from standing, standing um, to the side. So it's going to almost be like a crow hop and they're going to throw it. Um, position players, it's a similar thing, um, but they'll go through their, their swing mechanics with it, with a weighted ball. 
What what does that look like? So, so that I mean, it's basically the same thing. They'll they'll get in their batter stance, um, and they'll they'll hold the ball where they would hold the bat, and then they go through that. They go through the swing. I mean, it's, it's hard to it's hard to describe it with words and not be able to show you guys. Um, people don't see the video on this, right? It's just uh, no. We put it we put it on uh, YouTube. So yeah, you can oh, you right, can right. show if you yeah. So, yeah. So they'll hold the medicine ball up here. If I can stand up here. <laughs> hold up here. They'll go through their step and then they'll go through their swing and they'll kind of push the ball forward. Um, yeah. And then we'll use some bands and we'll work on the hip shoulder separation. Um, you know, and just basically just prepping the body for the, for the movement patterns that it's going to, it's going to use in the game. Is this all done in the weight room or is this done like before practice? Um, for baseball? Well, yeah, for the sports that are in the school, it's done in the weight room. Um, and then on the road, we'll do what we can. Um, you know, sometimes, I'll have time to pack up, you know, if nobody else is using them in the weight room, I'll pack up some medicine balls. Um, but for baseball, the way ours is set up, we've got medicine balls up at the field that we'll use in the bands and stuff up there. So they come what in. Kind of that, oh, go ahead. What kind of weight are you looking at there for like the, the weighted for, ball? For the pitcher, um, you know, most of them are going to use like, you know, six to 10 pounds. Um, you know, we're not going to go heavy with the pitcher one with, with the, the bat swing path. You know, I've got one kid that'll go up to 18 pounds. You know, I mean, ideally, ideally, we're you know, we're looking at speed and just just prepping the the movement pattern. Um, you know, it's it's not intended to get stronger with. It's it, you know, it's just a prep thing. Uh, so I, I guess kind of touching on that uh, from the hitting side, it's is creating speed or bat barrel barrel speed. Is that something that you have looked into? um understanding the swing and how to create um barrel speed um i guess it's kind of a big yeah, number now or it, is that something you guys are big on at walton in the baseball program or is it just kind of it you've kind of always built it in just based on your weight it, lifting it's kind of just, yeah i mean it's just kind of built in um you know i was fortunate you know one of the professors that i had in grad school um did a whole study on 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 the bat swing and the mechanics and, and generating more more velocity with it. Um, you know, so I looked at a lot of his research, and actually for one of the for our biomechanics class, um, we had to use his research. So I picked up a lot of it from that. Um, you know, but you know we're not we don't have a radar gun out there. At least we we talked about bringing one out this year. Um, you know, to to get like exit velocity and stuff like that. But it's not something that we've used up to this point. Tell Amos to get off the, the, the checkbook and let's get a radar gun. Stop messing around. I think we have one. I just don't think it's being used right now. Um, <laughs> is that something that you are interested in collecting from a, a strength standpoint? Or is yeah. that um, – I'm big, I'm big on the data. So, like, you know, one thing that I've, I – like, one thing that we did, um, I had some of my interns time, time, time our kids running. Um, and so – we didn't use the infield or anything. We, we went around the edge of the grass. And so to get a, just to get a muscular balance data points, we timed them from foul line to foul line. And I set cones up so they all had to take the same path. And then we timed them coming back the opposite direction. Right. I, I, did, I didn't want to see a big separation in times between the two. Yeah. Um, and for, for the most part, we didn't, we didn't have that much separation. There were a couple kids that did. You know, and I mean, that's something that we're going to have to address. And I'll probably run them through the FMS program um, before any other kids just to kind of figure out what's going on. Coach, what? I know you'll appreciate this. Coach, Coach Kelly and Coach Bounds, when, when we took over our program, we had two players, I think, who had a 90 mile per hour or better ball exit velocity coming off the bat. Uh, in that time with compilation of the weight room and the training that they do, I think we figured uh, coming into Christmas this year, boys, we had 15 players who were 90 or better on that ball exit velocity. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of that comes back to the weight room. But like you said, and, and Coach Kelly and Coach Bounds being a science guy and a math guy, they love data and they love measuring it and they love giving the kids that feedback so it allows those kids to grow just like the weight room. Well, and, and the kids like that. I mean, the, the kids love that because it – I mean, it creates buy-in with it because they're seeing they're seeing data that shows their progress. Absolutely, I can see that. 
And, and that's what, you know, talking about the radar gun, I mean, that's that's been the big thing that we have had is the radar gun inside our building to show it's accountability. I mean, a number right. pops up and you can't run from it. It's just like in the weight room, you get under there and you squat. You can't run from the number. You can't hide. Right. It, you're you're going you're gonna to have to lift that number and everybody's going to know what you're lifting. Um, I think, Coach, what was the quote you had last week afterwards when we had with Coach Howard? Nope. The weight room don't care. It doesn't care about your stars. It doesn't care about your rankings. It doesn't care about anything other than the work you show up and you put in daily. That's the only thing the weight room cares about. Well, see, and that goes back to that, the velocity-based training, right? I mean, having a speed number on, the, uh, on your lift, you're forced to put in that work. And, you know, I mean, even if it's a, say it's a 65%, right? I can do two very different 65% lifts, right? I could squat it slow and not put much effort into it, or I can explode out of the bottom and use a lot more energy and a lot more effort. Well, which one am I going to get more out of? Yeah. Right? The one I actually went fast on. Is there a lot of research between the two, the, the velocity and the max? Right, yeah. I mean, there's, well, there's a ton of research on, on the VBT. Like what yeah. are you looking for with it? I was just asking, I mean, yeah, I, I haven't really researched into it. So I was just asking if there's a lot more, is it more in the favor of velocity or is it more in the favor of the other direction? I haven't read any comparison papers on it. You know, I, I think, I mean, from what I've seen, you're going to get similar results, but with the velocity based training, you're going to get them using lighter weights. Right. So there's, there was, a, there, was a, there was a paper that I read recently. This was within the last couple of weeks. I don't, I don't remember when it was published, but it was, it was sometime in 2020. Um, that is now saying, cause you know, like the, the, the theory all along has been, you know, reps between one and five is for strength, six to 12 is hypertrophy. And then 13 or more is, is, is endurance, right? Muscular endurance. Well, the study that, that recently came out said that it doesn't really matter how many reps you go. As long as you're going to failure, you're going to have a similar result as if you were doing like three, like, you know, say, say you went 20 reps to failure and it was a lightweight, you're going to have a similar uh, muscular reaction to doing like three reps to failure at a heavyweight. That's interesting. Yeah, it was an interesting one. Um, and it's only one that I've seen on that and that says that, but you know, if you, if you factor that into the VBT stuff, it, it kind of does make sense. Yeah. Especially, yeah, you're trying to train for, you know, for power right. and the velocity portion of it, just being, you know, getting after it that way versus, okay, I'm just going to do three heavy lifts and just go real slow. Right. That's pretty interesting. It, do you, it, do you look at the athlete and just see which one responds better to something like that? Do some athletes just respond better to yeah, uh, I mean, velocity I, lifting? I mean, I, unfortunately at Walton, like we don't, we don't have the VBT technology. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got, I've got one push band. That's my own that I've brought in. Um, PJ Graybeck, the strength coach. I don't know if you guys know him. He's at Riverwood. He's got a whole set of it. So I think he's got, he's got a push band at every rack. Um, and so that's, that's, I mean, he was showing me their program last week when we were down there for basketball. Um, and that's, that's the basis of his whole program. Like, you know, we're using three rep max numbers and one rep max numbers. He's using VBT numbers. Yeah. And I honestly, I like his system a lot better just because it's going to be less wear and tear, you know, and strain on, on the athlete's body because they're moving lighter loads, even though they're moving faster. So taking that away, the velocity is more about keeping the light, um, keeping the rep or the, the workload light on the body over a long term instead of trying well, to max it out. And Yeah, I mean, like, if you think about it, like, which, ha which is going to have a higher injury risk? You know, somebody trying to hit a three rep max or somebody trying to move the bar faster than, you know, 0.7 meters per second at a lighter load? Yeah. Probably a three rep max is going to have a, a higher injury rate. You know, or yeah. even when do you see form start to break down, right? I mean, if, if we're heavy. going for – Exactly. Or, I mean, maybe not even if it's too heavy, you know, that might be a doable rep, but, you know, under a heavy load, if I've got a heavy bar on my back and I move just a little bit off, that heavy load's going to now put me in a more dangerous position 
you know, body position than if I'm just moving a, a lighter load quickly. Yeah. That's a lot. That, that, <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a that lot. Goes, to go back and look at. But that goes back to the a player's ability. Availability is the most important one. It doesn't matter. You know, I think that's Herm Edwards. Herm Edwards says it doesn't matter what your ability level is. If you're not available to play that day, then, then what good is that ability? So we've got to keep athletes on the field is what coaches say. Yeah. Oh, well, this has been a lot. Uh, is there anything else you guys like to add? Go. Um, I thought, oh, sorry. I thought, Matt, you were coming in to say something. So, no, I, I was uh, just thinking. Um, I, I'm, I'm really, really intrigued by the velocity-based training. I may be late to the party here, but uh, – Definitely something that I think is incredibly interesting. Um, would love to, you know, if you wouldn't mind an email coach asking you maybe a little bit, or if you wouldn't mind maybe some of our listeners shooting you an email. Um, I don't, don't mean to throw you out there like that, but I, you, you're just, you've got so much information um, about things that I would say new, new coaches and, you know, maybe one of the least emphasized areas of the game is the training, the, the flexibility, the, you know, these kind of things that you've talked about here, and it's so much for, especially for me, who's not as incredibly familiar with it, and I would love to, to look into a little more. Well, yeah, I've got some videos, too. I've got some videos um, from some of our football players that, that have used it that I've got. It was all on my old phone. My, you know, seven-year-old threw the phone. He lost <laughs> a video game on it or something and threw the phone and broke it, so I've got a new one, but – I've got them uploaded on, on Twitter somewhere or Instagram somewhere and I'll go back and try to find them and, and I can send it to you. Too. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be it, it shows like it shows Connor lifting. It, it's got the, it's got the speed and it, all the data on the screen during his lift so you can actually see it, see it all together. That's awesome. Uh, where, and if you don't mind, where could they find you at coach? Like how could they get in contact with you? Um, so Twitter and Instagram are, Usually that's what I'm on the most. Um, it's at Coach Chris underscore, um, and there's no H in Chris. So C O A C H C R I S underscore. Yeah, and and I will contest to this that if you do uh, hit him up on Twitter, he responds pretty quickly. Uh, I think every time I've written a message, he's had a response within 30 seconds. So I, I appreciate the uh, <laughs> the uh, the response time. So um, yeah, family's out of town this weekend, so. <laughs> <laughs> Seems that a lot of stuff gets done when that happens. So, uh, well, now, co co coach, coach, everybody in this this group right here would agree the weight room is important. If there's a coach right now and he's listening to this podcast and he's not sold out on the weight room, he he, he thinks for baseball it's just not that important. We got to swing more. We've got to throw more. Give me a little bit to that coach who's listening right now on why he needs to be in the weight room and, and what it can do for his program. Oh man, that's that, that's that's a big question. Um, I mean, I think number one, from just an injury standpoint, an injury prevention standpoint, you know, the the weight room training your muscles under load. You know, when you get into a situation where your muscles have to be in, you know, maybe not the best, you know, biomechanical position, but yet they're used to training under load, you're going to have less chance of getting hurt. You know, so if you you know, take, take completely take out the sports performance side of it, you know, and trying to get the athletes stronger and faster um, and more powerful, just the injury prevention part of it alone, you know, is worth the time. Because again, just like we said a couple of minutes ago, you know, if it kid can be the best athlete you've got, if, if they're not on the field, it doesn't give you any better. You know, and then I think, I mean, I think any coach wants to put their kids in the best possible situation to, perform as you know at, at their peak you know so why would you not want to invest in the weight room yeah. absolutely i i yeah. think it's the quickest separator uh when it comes to high school sports is the difference between you know you have a kid that runs out that's 130 pounds and you run out another kid that's 190 pounds asking them to do the same exact thing and they might have the same physical skills but the ball doesn't travel as far with a kid that weighs more or it doesn't he doesn't throw the ball as hard he might throw and this is what another thing a lot of kids that have, have, my pitchers have brought up I can throw 87 and I'm like you can throw 87 at 140 pounds but your body's going to break down quicker than the guy that can throw 
you know, the oh, yeah. 89 at 190 pounds. Your, your body's just not equipped to handle that workload over time, which we've been talking about. And eventually, yeah, you throw that hard, but you're going to break down and it's just not going to last. Whereas if you build that there's muscle lot, around it. There's a lot even, there's a lot to add to that too, right? I mean, more muscle fibers, the more muscle fibers you have, the more force you're going to be able to produce. Yeah. Right. So if you're, if you're adding weight and it's, you know, muscle mass weight, you're going to have more muscle fibers that, that you can use to produce velocity in the ball. Um, you know, if, yeah, I mean, from a sports performance standpoint, that would be the number one thing, right? You can get faster, stronger, and more powerful in the weight room. In baseball, I mean, how many, how many, play, how many close plays are there that you get thrown out of the base? Right? I mean, if that was, I just, I, so there's a new book that came out, The Science of Sprinting. Fantastic book. I, I highly recommend it for anybody that coaches athletes um, in a sport where they have to run. But in there, it, you know, it gave the example of, you know, in a 100 meter sprint, the, the difference between 10 seconds and 10.1 seconds is only 10%. But in the actual results of the race, that makes a big difference. And then if you look at, you know, stealing first to second or trying to leg out a double, you know, how many close plays are there that bang, bang plays where the runner gets thrown out? Well, if you could have been, you know, just, a, you know, a half a second faster, then you're safe. You know, so over the course of a season, you know, wouldn't it be better to develop your players into being faster? You know, not every, not every athlete is going to be fast, but every athlete can get faster. That's yeah. an actual quote. It's a quote from the book. Um, you know, and I, I really like that quote. That's, you know, one of the big takeaways that I've got from, from it. Um, well, I mean, if you think about it, Coach, there's probably a hundred – I mean, this, and this is somewhat – semi-random number. There's probably a hundred scenarios over the course of a season that are bang-bang plays. Oh, Yeah. So if you can turn 50% of those in your favor, you've now flipped 50 plays from negative to positive. Right. I mean, that's insane when you think about it. And that's a minimum of 50 more at bats that your kids get. Yeah. Well, that's crazy. Economics again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, people ask that I have an economics degree, um, you know, but it's, it's it factors in it. You know, the, the economics and the science side uh, of – of this field is huge. Now, coach, as a, as a strength coach, we, we have a, a saying in our program that we want to win the national anthem. Uh, we want to line it up on the line, look across the field. As a strength coach, when you line it up with Walton and you look across the field and you know you've won that national anthem, you know, what does that tell you about your program compared to that team across the field? I mean, it makes me feel pretty good. Um, you know, I mean, our, our kids – for the most part, our kids really buy in pretty easily to the weight room. Um, you know, and, and the baseball has, has had the weight training class for a long time, you know, before I came, came over as well. Um, you know, and so we've just built upon that. But I mean, it, the weight room is a big part of Walton for, for all the sports. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good point to end on right there is that the weight room is the center of every program. Uh, you, you go to any school where Coach the weight – go ahead. Coach, before we leave, I was told I have to bring this up to Coach Romano. Okay. He's got to talk about his shoe game because I've heard okay. his shoe game <laughs> is maybe better than his than his weight training game. And so let's just give him a few minutes to talk about his love of shoes because <laughs> we discussed it earlier. And, and, and I know this guy wants to talk about shoes just for a few seconds. <laughs> I, I might wear a different pair every day and not repeat a pair for our games. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got our, 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 in all honesty um our head head boys lacrosse coach um griffin spots has the best shoe game out of out of anyone that i know um dude's got over 250 pairs um, <laughs> name, name a big shoe like the travis scott jordan ones um you know origin story he's got them all i mean <laughs> his his shoe collection he and i like i mean we talk probably an hour a day either in person or on text about shoes. Um, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, think, I think between the two of us, we signed up for like 20 something raffles for tomorrow's drops. Um, I can't even remember what shoes are dropping tomorrow even. You know, my, my wife is trying her best to put a stop to this and it's just not, it's not working in her favor. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out, so like I wear like, 
I have not repeated a shoe for football or basketball games because I'm on the sideline with both of those sports. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do it for baseball because I don't want to bring, you know, my really expensive yeah. Jordan out onto the field. Right. And I do have I do have some Jordan 1 cleats, but Coach Amos isn't a big fan of, you know, unnecessarily wearing cleats on the field. <laughs> so I, 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 one of my hobbies is restoring old Jordans. So, like, I'll, I'll find – like, I, I bought a pair of – Jordan five Laney's for 25 bucks, you know, knew the shoes like $400. Um, you know, it's all torn up, needs repainted um, and everything, you know, so I, I pay $25 for the shoe, maybe $5 in supplies. And the shoe looks almost new now. You know, so and you do, it all, I you do, do it, it all yourself. I do it all yourself. Yeah. Awesome. Um, you know, my wife's like, well, good. now you can sell that for, you know, like 150 bucks and you only paid, you know, $30 in. I said, well, but this is a shoe that I could wear to the baseball games because if it gets messed up, <laughs> in, and I know how to fix it. Yeah, and, and why sell it? I only got 30 bucks into it, you know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some other shoes that are like $700 and, you know, she wants me to sell those. And I'm, I'm not about to sell those either. So, so if, <laughs> you, if, he has, if he has 250 pairs, how many pairs of shoes do you have? I've, I've, so the Jordans are the only ones that really matter for me. I've got, I've got 37. Yeah. 37. You know, the every now and then, like the Midnight Navy Jordan ones that came out a couple months ago are my favorite pair. Um, you know, I'll wear those like twice a month, but most of them I'll wear once a month. Like right now I've got the Jordan one uh, Zen greens on. This is probably the only time in December that I'll wear them. And are you the guy that's like walking all awkward so you don't crease them? <laughs> no, because I, I know how to get the creases out. Uh, all, all there you go. That are all creased up so I can get them cheaper. And yeah. then, you know, within the first couple hours of taking them out of the box, they, I get the creases out. Yeah, I, I love the kid that walks into class with, like, a new pair of Jordans. And they're like, you better not crease those things. You're, like, yelling at each other, you know. So. Yep. Oh, no, I've, I've done that. I've, I've walked in, like, towards the beginning of the semester, I'll walk in with, like, a really nice pair of Jordans on. And, you know, somebody asked me, you know, hey, can you demonstrate whatever, you know, whatever movement is. And I do it. And so, some, like, some freshmen is always like, coach, you're, you're Jordans. And I'll look right at them and just like go into a lunch or something and, and freak them out. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do that with just because like the patent leather Jordan ones, you can't really get the creases out. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Uh, but if they're the regular leather ones, you can easily, you know, 10 minutes and I can get the creases out. <laughs> Another <laughs> podcast. I've got a whole system. Uh, creases I, down the days. <laughs> I, I wear, I, I, so I don't repeat a shoe. Last thing on the shoes. So I don't repeat a shoe. I've got a whole spot in the garage set up. So when I come home, I take the shoe off, I set it in that spot in the garage, and then I'll cycle through all of the shoes, and then I'll have a, like a, a cleaning party day. And I'll clean all the <laughs> shoes, bring them inside, and, and set them up and, and start all over. <laughs> <laughs> are all, are, and all your outfits match the shoes? Are they all oh, set no. up? No, uh, I mean, no. like I'm, I'm wearing gray, gray sweatpants and green shoes right now. Like, yeah. Coach Amos gives me a real hard time about the Jordans. <laughs> I, one one awesome. day I'll get him to buy. There you go. You just need contact and see if they'll sponsor uh, Walton High School. You already got yeah. all the. So. Well, no, our, all all of our strength and conditioning shirts are well. Most of our strength and conditioning shirts are Jordan brand because we're we're tied with Nike. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. So the BSN guys can get me the Jordan stuff. So nice. All right. Well, well, coach, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on the show. That was a lot of information. Um, we, we definitely need to have you back on because uh, I, I don't even think we even really touched the surface of how deep we can get. But um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, please, if you need, if you have any questions, like you said, reach out to uh, coach on Twitter. It was at coach Chris with no H underscore. Um, like we said, he is quick to respond and he'll answer any of your questions. Um, as you heard it, he's very knowledgeable. He's been through it all. He understands the strength game and the shoe game, it sounds like. So that's, uh, that's huge. So, uh, but once again, Coach, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We will be back. Um, happy holidays to everybody, and we'll be back soon. Talk to you guys Thanks, later. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Coach. Anytime.